Oh, hey, how are you? I've left it a little bit late tonight, so um, this is only going to be a very, very short episode. I've even had to move my laptop over. Look, you've got a slightly different angle for the dangle tonight, because if I put it back normally, oh, hang on, this way, it's really dark, and it's only five past seven. Anyway, what we'll do for our read-along of Garth Nick's Lady Friday, part of the Keys of the Kingdom series, Hockey Books edition. What we'll do, we'll start on page 132, if you've got the same edition as me, and we'll only do a few pages. So this is going to be a mega, mega short one. All right. Last night, Truce, we left it, we left Leaf, didn't we? She'd just met Lady Friday. So I'm guessing that tonight we'll pick it up with Arthur, because it's seeming to go... One chapter Arthur, one chapter Leaf. One chapter Arthur, one chapter Leaf. Are you noticing that too? So um, I'm going to guess that we're going to pick it up with Arthur tonight. But hey, we'll see. We're starting chapter 10, but only a few pages. Here we go. The white look discounts at me, said Uggam, referring to his brief conversation with Saturday's dusk. I hazard he feared some plot. Oh, no, he's got a high-pitched voice, hasn't he? I want him to have a deep voice. Uggum seems like he's going to have a deep voice. I hazard he feared some ploy or contrivance, and it is certain he is wary of your power. <coughs> he has agreed to wait upon you, Lord Arthur, at the appointed half-hour. Yet, I misdoubt is I misdoubt it is an honest answer. I'm just going to give him a deep voice. More likely he awaits the arrival of more doughty warriors before ordering the assault. Like more of whatever was making that noise before, said Fred with a shudder. I just hope the fetchers, or something worse, aren't watching the canal side, said Arthur. He pushed the shutters open wide and shivered as the wind blew in, spraying him with wet snow. Wait till I'm down safe, then follow me one at a time. Here, said Susie, I should go first, so when you fall in the canal, I can get you out. Or me, said Fred, I should go first, because you're too important, Arthur. I'm going to go first, said Arthur. Remember what Sergeant Helf said about leading. Follow me. With that shout, he leapt across the gap between the window and the huge wheel, timing it so that he would land on the spoke as it was almost level with the building. But he was a second off and the ice-sheathed spoke was already tilting down. Arthur landed on it, but he immediately started to slide, his fingers clutching frantically at the frozen timber as his legs went over the far side, the canal side. His fingers slipped, unable to get a hold. Arthur swung his legs back as he fell and managed to get his knee back on the spoke. Then, with an effort that felt as if he might have wrenched every muscle he possessed, he held himself up, slithering across the spoke to the other side, just in time to half roll and half fall off onto the snowy bank of the canal. Behind him, the lower end of the spoke he'd been on entered the water with the crackle of broken ice and a threatening gurgle. What's a threatening gurgle? <laughs> anyway, Arthur wanted to lie in the snow, no matter how cold and wet it was, but he knew he couldn't. He forced himself up and looked around to make sure there was no danger of attack. When he was sure no fetches or anything worse was nearby, he looked back up at the turning wheel. Susie was already on it, sliding down the descending spoke like a surfer down a wave. She jumped across to the shore with perfect timing, sending a spray of snow over Arthur as she touched down. That was all right, that was fun, she declared. <coughs> Excuse me. Arthur scowled at her and scraped some snow off himself while he waited for Fred or Ruggum to come down next. It was Fred who, while lacking Susie's style, nevertheless did a workmanlike job of riding a spoke down on all fours, jumping like a dog at the end to land in a crouch near Susie and Arthur. 
Uggam chose an entirely different method. Benefiting from having observed the others, he jumped with a dagger in his hand, thrusting it into the timber to give himself a secure handhold. He used that hold to position himself square in the middle of the spoke, then worked the dagger free, slid down to the wheel's inner rim, stood up and stepped off onto the canal side as easily as Arthur might have stepped off an escalator back home. Come on, let's go declared Arthur. He waved his hand and pointed west along the canal before pushing through the waist-high snow. He only went a few paces before Uggam overtook him. It were best I forge a path, said Uggam, lowering his charged spear to the snow ahead. He twisted the bronze grip to activate it. The spear point glowed with sudden heat, the snow melting away to create a channel that Uggam widened by the simple method of pushing through. The three children followed in his wake, their way made much easier. It's a lot faster, said Arthur, but we're leaving a completely obvious trail, not to mention the light. I would leave a trail anyway, said Fred. It's not snowing enough to cover the tracks. Uggy's keeping a spear point down, not much light showing there, added Susie. It's the, o it's the only light around though said Arthur, glancing about. Strangely, it didn't seem any darker than it had been when he'd first looked out from the tower. He felt much colder, though, chilled through to his bones despite the heavy aprons he wore, and every few minutes a shiver would pass through him that he couldn't suppress. But, guess we've got no choice. We need to find this paper pusher wharf quickly. I hope they've got somewhere nearby that we can shelter for the night. I don't think there's going to be a night, said Fred as he stopped for a moment to squint up at the snow-clouded sky. I reckon the sun's got stuck again. There won't be no morning either, though. It will stay like this till someone goes and fixes it. Oh, great, muttered Susie. Perpetual twilight and freezing snow. I thought the lower house was managed badly enough. <coughs> it's not that bad. Oh, it's not that bad said Fred. It's nice enough inside the workshops or the town. Oh, I bet, said Susie. Freezing ain't out here though, ain't it? <laughs> Look, we'd better be quiet, ordered Arthur. It was freezing and he was already greatly tempted to use the key to warm himself and the others, though they were probably better able to cope, being less mortal than himself. If they didn't find shelter, he was going to have to f use the key. They slogged on through the snow in silence. As Fred had predicted, the sky grew no darker, a dim twilight prevailing. The wind, the weather remained much the same too, with scattered showers of snow that never really got started properly, but also never really stopped. After they'd gone at least a mile, Arthur called a brief halt. He was very tired, mostly from the cold. The four of them huddled together around Uggam's spear point warm in their hands. Arthur could barely feel the top joints of his fingers, and his nose and cheekbones didn't feel much better either. "'You need a hat, Arthur,' said Susie. She took off her own new nithling issue fur hat and pulled it down on Arthur's head before he could protest. Then, as he feebly tried to lift it off, she whipped a handkerchief out of her sleeve and tied it over her head and her ears. "'I can't take your hat,' said Arthur, but Susie skipped away as he tried to hand it back. Recognising the futility of trying to get her to do something she didn't want to do, Arthur put her hat back on. He had to admit, he did immediately feel warmer. He remembered reading somewhere that people lost most of their heat through the head and kicked himself for not thinking of it before. He couldn't afford to make simple mistakes like forgetting to wear a hat. Any more simple mistakes, Arthur thought. Here, how far is this wharf? asked Susie. I'm not really sure, said Arthur. Half a parsang, whatever that is. Do you know, Fred? I've never gone far from letter as lark, but I don't think a half parsang is that far. I've seen a canal, but never a wharf. The paper pushers don't have a very good reputation, though. I don't care about their reputation, so long as they've got a fire, said Susie. Arthur nodded. He knew that if he kept talking, his teeth would chatter and he didn't want to show the others how cold he really was. Instead, he stood up and pointed west. Uggam immediately rose and started out once again, once more melting the snow. Arthur followed with Susie close behind and Fred bringing up the rear. 
They hadn't gone very far when Argum stopped and turned back to face the others. Something ahead, he whispered, lying in the snow. I do know, I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave you with that in your head. Something up ahead, lying in the snow. Ooh, Mr. S. Cliffhanger. <laughs> so, um, what I'm going to keep up with it, and I'm going to do some comments before I hang up for the evening. I don't know what's going on here with this bit of hair, though. There we are, tuck that back up there. Right, what we got going on on the comments? There's quite a few, I think, my goodness. Uh, lots of people saying about um, my pineapple fritter thievery last night. I can see lots of those comments. <laughs> Here's Mary, what's she saying? Sunday morning, oh yeah, because I asked everybody what you did yesterday and I can see that Mary has told me. If you haven't told me, you've lost points. Although, Nettie, you did already tell me as well didn't you, um, by reply to you, so yours is gone, so Nettie said that um, they had a very, uh, you, just, you sang me a song, didn't you, easy, was it easy like Sunday morning, no, uh, lazy Sunday, I can't remember the song, but I replied with one of the lyrics anyway, didn't I, Nettie, anyway, here's Mary, sorry Mary, Sunday mornings we always Skype chat, nice, Oh, yeah, oh yeah, um, one of Mary's sons completed a full marathon, 42k, what? And after 26k on the flat in a valley, the rest going up a mountainside. Blimey, that is pretty hardcore actually. Um, ah, Mary also tells us what her business was here. I'm not going to tell you what it was, you'll have to go and read it yourself, won't you? Uh, that sounds like an... I, I would use that business, Mary. I really would. <laughs> I would use that business, Mary, because mine is particularly smelly at the moment. <laughs> and sharp. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I'd do that. And shedding. Anyway. <laughs> uh, now you're going to have to go and read what Mary's business was, aren't you? Uh, here's Truce. What are you saying, Truce? Which Truce is also telling me to get back down that chip shop. All right, Truce. All right. Cool. Uh, so then I had this other cop. Then I had this other comment on here. It's just called user ls, and this is on um one of the David Williams playlists, chapter thirty one and thirty two. And this user has written, "I subscribe in six accounts." Nice. I feel a little bit like I'm cheating with you doing that, user ls. But then. The confusing bit here, L uh, user LS, blah, 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 blah. on your next comment, you've written best dad. Now, I've asked my four children, was this you? And there wasn't any of them. <laughs> so, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> but thanks, if you're saying, uh, uh, maybe I said something in that that I can't remember saying about my children. And you said, oh, you're a best dad. Maybe that's what's going on there. And here is another new person, but not on this playlist. This one is on the Wintersmith playlist. Samantha Jane Scott. Captain Carrot, Sergeant Detroiters, Corporal Nobby. Love the Ankhmore Pork City Watch. Don't we all, Samantha Jane Scott? Don't we all? <laughs> all right, okay. Can you see how dark is getting? I don't like it. New t-shirt, by the way. Although it's not actually that new. I got it for my birthday. And, um... I've only just got around to wearing it because it's it's pretty hefty. I won't stand up, but um yeah. But look, Blake got me this. That's cool, isn't it? Motley Crew. Last year, Blake and I went and saw Motley Crew in London. That was a good day. That was a good day. Oh, so um yeah, that's why he got me this T-shirt. You see. All right. Okay. I haven't got anything else exciting to say. So. All I will say is have a lovely evening. Have a lovely Tuesday. I've got a late meeting tomorrow, but hopefully I'll be here to finish chapter 10. As I always say, if I'm not here, don't panic. It's all right. I promise I will come back as soon as I can. All right. That's my deal to you to read you a nice bedtime story. All right. Okay. See you soon. Love you lots.